asleep. That's true, Anna, yes. It is very difficult for me to understand how you can fall asleep during Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. Well, I'll explain, Annie. I fell asleep during Beethoven's Fifth Symphony because Beethoven's Fifth Symphony bores me shitless. You are joking again. Are you joking? I'm never sure when you are joking. I think that you are always joking when you are being coarse. No, I mean, I am never joking when I am being coarse. I don't like it when you are coarse. Then you must be having a really bad time with it. You listen to Beethoven, Major. My favorite is the Eighth Symphony, but you should listen especially to the Ninth. Beethoven wrote it in his last year. It is one of the most beautiful pieces of music ever written. You should listen to it, Major. Is it the same length as number five, or as he got older, did he write shorter? Yes, you are joking. But you must listen to it, Major. That is why I have brought you these recordings, so that you should know with whom you are dealing. I know with whom I'm dealing. I knew another band leader once. The name of Dix Dixon. Small time, also sax. Not bad. Not good, but not bad. Played one night stands in Illinois and Michigan. A house he owned, where he and the band used to stay, burned down. Lost everything. Oh, almost everything. But I got it. You know how? Because there's always one question the guilty can't answer. Get a sign writer, write it be. There's always one question the guilty can't answer. Dix's case, it was, how come, Dix? Everybody lost everything except you. You got your clothes, your sacks, how come? Couldn't answer. He was dumb. Boy, was he dumb. Oh, the bookies. You understand, don't you, Annie? He burned down his own house for the insurance money. <coughs> Used to call that Jewish lightning. Well, how many people will I have to see before the big boys do? Just one. Helmut Boulder, built by a lady from 1935 to the present. Oh, and Major, I request from Wiesbaden that you see a Mrs. Tamaraza. I have talked with her on the telephone and she could be coming at 2 o'clock. Anything but Wiesbaden's got to be bad news. <coughs> What's this Mrs. Zacks want? She wouldn't say. Oh, and Major, a young officer put his head around the door a moment ago, so that you were asleep and then disappeared. Who was he? I don't know. I have never seen him before. And two other messages. Captain Bell and I may visit later, and Colonel Walcott will not be attending. Oh, that's a relief. Not even the British? No. <coughs> uh, where's that young officer now? I don't know. He came and went. I'll go find him, will you, honey? According to Major Arnold, sir. For Christ's sake, I hate that shit. Cut it up. My name's Steve. What's yours? David. David Wills. Who are you? I've taken over from Captain Greenwood. I'm your new liaison officer with Allied Intelligence. Well, what happened to Hank? Captain Greenwood was ordered to Nuremberg. Seems they need more interpreters at the trial. So you're dealing with the British now? Yes, sir. You call me sir again, I'll make you listen to Beethoven. <laughs> you seen that uh, limey major yet? The one who talks like he's got ice cubes in his mouth? I can't tell if he's speaking German or English. What the hell is his name? Major Richards. Yeah, Alan Richards. I just talked to him this morning, but he was rushing off to an urgent meeting. An urgent meeting? Yeah, the uh, Hinkle Archive. Yes. Do you know what's in the Hinkle Archive? No. And uh, if it turns out to be important, do you think the British will share it with their allies? He said he'd call to let you know. He said he was very disappointed. He wanted to be here today, especially today. We uh, recruiting children now? I guess so. Where are you from? I was born here. Not in Berlin, in Hamburg. Uh, I escaped in 34 when I was 12. And my parents sent me to my uncle in Philadelphia. They were to follow, but they delayed and delayed. They did not follow. Our family name is Byer, but that doesn't sound well in English, so my uncle changed it to Wills. Mm. Did you hear that, Amy? David here was born in Hamburg. Yes, I heard. I'm sorry about your parents. Oh, this is uh, Amy Straw. She records the interview. She's been here every week. She's a good German, aren't you, Amy? Her father was in the plot against Adolf. Well, now, what kind of an intelligence officer are you, David? 
should have asked a question. You should have asked, but how do we know she didn't report her father for being in the plot against St. Albans? Now, we should have asked, Emmy. Emmy's okay. You're okay, aren't you, Emmy? Should I see if Mr. Hoda is here, Major? It's after nine. When I say so, Emmy. When I say so. I like to keep them waiting and make them sweat, which is a kindness in this weather, wouldn't you say? I expect Mr. Hoda is here, Major. Oh, she won't call me Steve, David. She's so correct. <laughs> She likes books and poetry, and she's just crazy about Beethoven, aren't you, Emmy? Do you like Beethoven, David? Yes. Yeah, I thought you looked funny when I threatened you with the old bastard. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess you like the you know, musicians. You admire them. So, don't. Don't what? This is uh, like a criminal investigation, David. Musicians, morticians, lawyers, butchers, doctors, clerks, they're all the same. I saw Bergen Belson two days after it was liberated. I know what I'm talking about. I've seen things with these eyes. Do you know what I'm talking about, David? Yes. Think of your parents. Don't think of musicians. We're after the big guy here, the band leader. That's the one we're going to nail. You know what I call him, David? I call him a piece of shit. I call them all pieces of shit. Captain Greenwood says hard evidence against him is difficult to come by. Well, let's talk about that after we get through with this guy, Rhoda. Now, uh, here's how we do it. This is my show. I ask the questions. You want to ask a question? You raise a finger so we can't see you. I'll signal. Yeah, you're going to answer. Yes. I'll explain my technique. I tell the shitheads why they're here. Then I only ever ask two questions. First, anything that comes to mind. How are you feeling today? You got enough to eat? Do you need some cigarettes? Real friendly. Second, I say, I see from your questionnaire that you were never a member of the party. Is that right? Absolutely right. I was never a member of the party. And I wait. I say nothing. I wait. And then they talk. Oh, boy, did they talk. They'll tell you what a great guy a band leader is and uh, how he divide Adolf and Herman and Joseph. Oh, yes, and they always get in the baton story. And what's the baton story? How many have I questioned, Emmy? 28. So this guy, uh, Helmut Rhoda. Rhoda. He'll be number 29. You'll hear the baton story <coughs> for the first time. I'll hear it for the 29th. Oh, yeah, and they uh, always manage to find out Emmy's last name, don't they, Emmy? Strauber, they say, in relation to Joachim Strauber. My father, Emmy says, a great man, they say, a great hero. You see, David, what they're trying to do is cover the band leader in roses in the hope that they'll come up smelling just as sweet. But it's... Uh, Difficult to smell sweet after you crawl through raw sewage. I was in insurance before the war, a claims assessor. What were you in? College. And when all this is over? I'd like to teach history. History? You need a good memory for history, don't you? All those dates and battles. Your memory good? Not bad. Me? I've got a terrific memory. I've been examined by psychologists. Oh, because of my memory, nothing else. I've got what they call a total recall. I remember everything. It's a curse. Yeah, curse, believe me. But I'm bad at names. It's what the shrinks call selective. Tell you the truth, my recall is not total, but it's pretty good. Yeah, insurance. I was uh, trained by a guy called Lou O'Donnell, kind of Jimmy Cagney type. Pushy, smart, persistent. Boy, was that guy persistent. Lou taught me to look out for what he called repetitive evidence, because 99 times out of 100, covers a conspiracy to default. Do you think a, a whole orchestra of about 120 or so guys could be orchestrated? I don't know. I guess it's possible. Yeah. Me too. I guess it's possible. Okay, Henry. Let's get Mr. Rowan in here. Now you sit here. Remember, this is my show. I ask questions. Just the two <coughs> questions. And then we'll wait. We'll see. Mr. Helmut Holder. 
I want you to understand why you're here. This is a preliminary investigation into Wilhelm Furtwang, the former Prussian Privy Councillor, who's been banned from public life under Control Council Directive Number 24, and who's applied to come before the Tribunal of Arts of the Denazification Commission. We're interested in what he was up to from 1933 to the end of the war. You understand? Yes. I have your questionnaire here. Helmut Alfred Rhoda, second violinist, Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra since 1935. What's that mean, Helmut, uh, second violinist? Boy, it means I wasn't good enough to be a first violinist. Huh? <laughs> but mind you, you have to be pretty good just to be a second violinist in the Berlin Philharmonic, uh, even though I say so myself. <laughs> and according to your questionnaire, Helmut, you never joined the party. Uh, me? Never, never. I hated them. Believe me, please, I know everyone now says they were never Nazis, but in my case it is absolutely 100% true. I am a Catholic, a convert. It would have been totally against my conscience. It's difficult to explain what it was like. Terror, that's what you felt from morning till night. Even asleep you felt terror. In the early days, of course, we were much more open in our opposition. When I think back on the things I said, I, I shudder. My God, I used to tell jokes, anti-Hitler jokes. I was well known for my anti-Hitler jokes. <laughs> for example, this joke. It was very famous around 1933-34. A couple of old Jews. One says to the other, I have two bits of news for you. One good, one bad. Can we so go to his first? Hitler is dead. Oh, and the bad news? It isn't true. <laughs> <laughs> That's the sort of joke I used to tell. <laughs> but you want to know about Dr. Furtwängler. This man is, uh, without doubt, one of the most courageous people it has been my honor to know. We all acknowledge he is a god among musicians. In my humble second violinist opinion, the greatest conductor alive. True, I have not played under Artur Toscanini, but I have heard his recordings, and the emotion is not the same. Toscanini is a, is a metronome. Dr. Furtwängler is an artist. No, no, Wilhelm Furtwängler is unquestionably a genius without equal. Is it true you're going to interview him today? Berlin is so full of rumors, I had... Oh, you hear things all the time. If rumors were edible, we'd all be well fed. <laughs> yeah. I, if I may say so, I hope you see truth that he's properly guarded. There's so many crazy people about now. He gave comfort in terrible times. What man can do more? Here is something that may interest you. On a famous occasion, I think it was the second Winter Assistance Charity Program, it was suddenly announced that Hitler himself was going to attend. Well, you can imagine the Vice Roy was furious. He, you know how angry he was? He ripped the wooden covering off the radiator in his dressing room. That's how angry he was. Because what could he do? He couldn't tell Hitler not to attend. <laughs> you see, the problem was the Nazi salute. He absolutely refused to give it. Now this I heard with my own ears. I heard him say, I don't have to acknowledge him at all. Over and over again I heard him say that. But how could he avoid giving the devil's salute with Satan actually present in the audience? You know who came up with a solution? I said, Maestro, why not enter with the baton in your right hand? Hitler will be sitting on the front row, and if you give the salute with the baton in your right hand, it looked like you're going to poke his eyes out. <laughs> he was very grateful to me for that suggestion. He came onto the podium, the baton in his right hand, which meant he couldn't give the salute. He just bowed quickly, turned immediately to us, and even while the audience was still applauding, he gave the signal to begin. I tell you in confidence, after the concert, I did something disreputable. I stole that baton. 
as a memento of a great act of courage. I still have it. I should have brought it to show you. Uh, mind you, mind you, it was always a joke with the orchestra, the maestro's baton. He has a very eccentric technique. He, he, he waves, he sways, he jiggles. <laughs> God knows when you're meant to come in. Other musicians used to ask us, they'd say, how do you know when to play the first chord of the Eroica? When his baton reaches the third spot in his shirt, we'd say. <laughs> or, or, how do you know when to start the semiquavers at the beginning of the ninth? We tell him, we tell him. The moment our maestro enters, we all walk around our chairs three times, sit down, come to ten, and play. <laughs> or, or, or when we lose patience. <laughs> and yet, he can make musical sounds like no other human being alive. I hope I'm not going too fast for you, Fräulein. Uh, Strauber. Strauber? Any relation to the parent of your name, Strauber? My father. I'm deeply honored to be in your presence, Fräulein. Your father was a true patriot and a man of God. Where we get in that city? No, no, I want to say categorically, Wilhelm Furtwängler did not serve the regime. None of us who are members of this orchestra serve the regime. Forgive me if I make a philosophical observation, but Wilhelm Furtwängler is a symbol to the entire world of all that is great in culture and music, and the Nazis needed him. They needed him to make themselves respectable. Uh, David, you have a question, Herr Hammer. Yes. There is a photograph, isn't there, Mr. Roda, of Dr. Furtwängler shaking hands with Hitler. How do you explain that? But that's the concert I was talking about, the all Beethoven program when he came on with the baton in his right hand to avoid giving the salute. As I said, Hitler was sitting in the front row. And after the concert, he suddenly stood up, went to the platform, and offered the maestro his hand. And the maestro took it. What else could he do? That's all there was to it. I was there. I witnessed it. Oh, it was probably a calculated act, not spontaneous at all. Because they wanted the maestro on their side. Of course they did. So they had photographers there. And, and what would the maestro do? He simply had to shake Satan's hand. That's all there is to it. And he did not conduct the Meister Singer at the Party Congress in Nuremberg in 1935. We played it the evening before the Congress. The music was quite separate from the politics. That is the Meister's creed. Art and politics must be kept separate. And it was the same for the Devil's Birthday. And uh, it, we played it the evening before, April 19th, not 20th. And the Meister was tripped into it. Usually when they asked him to conduct on such occasions, he managed to get the doctors to diagnose spondylitis. It's an inflammation of the vertebrae in the back and neck. Common in conductors are very, very painful. But for Satan's birthday in 1942, Goebbels got to the doctors first, and that was that. And don't forget, please, the maestro had to flee to Switzerland only last year because he learned that the Gestapo were about to arrest him. This is the, an honest, good man we are talking about, and the greatest conductor alive. Mr. Voda, you only joined the Berlin Philharmonic in 1935. Where were you before that? I, I was a member of another orchestra in Mannheim. And in 1935, several vacancies arose in Berlin. I, I auditioned and... Yes, yes, but on the other hand, Dr. Furtwängler personally was very good to Jews. He helped a lot of Jews escape. Jews who were no longer allowed to be members of the orchestra, though he fought to retain them for as long as he could. Secretary, Delta Geismar, was a Jewess. He relied so much on her. And in the end, he had to help her to escape, too. She is now, I believe, in England, secretary to Sir Thomas Beecham. He is also a conductor, but he is not Dr. Furtwängler. Helmut, uh, do you know Hans Hinkle? Do I know Hans Hinkle? That's what I asked. Do I know Hans Hinkle? You seem to understand the question, Helmut. Now, how about answering it? <laughs> but how could I know such a man? Hans Hinkle was in the Ministry of Culture. How could I know such a man? I, I hear he, he kept an archive, files, records. Do you know what's in the archive, Major? I was just going to ask you that, Helmut. Me? Well, how could I know what's in the archive? But the only thing I've heard is that there are letters from people swearing loyalty to the regime. 
in my humble second violinist opinion for what it's worth, <laughs> is that Hinkle was in fact a very low level functionary. His archive won't have anything of interest. Okay, you can go now, Helmet. That's it? Get out, Helmet. Wastrel. He's here, Major. Sit down, Emmy. We're going to keep him waiting, too. So, now you know the Tom story. Is. Yes, but Captain Greenwood is right. When it comes to hard evidence... Just some more coffee, will you, Emmy? And Emmy, don't offer coffee to the leader of the band. Don't even greet him, okay? Jesus, when are they going to fix the central team? My scrotum feels like a shriveled prune. <laughs> Probably looks like <laughs> Let me tell you something, David. The evidence, Clark or soft, doesn't matter because I've got the one question he's going to find it impossible to answer. I returned here to be near my mother. 
My father was with the army of occupation in Denmark. I shall turn 33 next week. Look at my hair. I am trying to return to France, but the French authorities are not helpful. I want to die in Paris. It was the only place we were happy. So, Mary, where are you staying? Because I'll have you taken back there. I was a philosophy student in 1932 at the university here in Berlin. I was 18 years old. I was taken to a recital in a private house to hear young pianists. The house belonged to Dr. Mirosam, was a very famous piano teacher at the time. The young pianist was Walter Sachs, age 17, a year younger than me. I fell in love with him, just listening to him play. He was very beautiful. We were married. He was a Jew. I lost my maiden name was Müller. Just tell us how Dr. Furbanker figures in all this. It is an outrage what you are doing, you know. What are we doing? Behaving like them. What happened to your husband, Mrs. Sachs? He died in Auschwitz. That is in Poland. I do not know the exact date. And Dr. Sputfanger? We were tipped off that my husband was going to be arrested within the week. We had no money, no influence. We went rushing around to Mira Samuel. We asked for help. She said she'd see what she could do. That evening she sent a message. We had such and such an address at midnight. There was a cellar. On tonight's house, we closed down. We were terrified. We knocked. Dr. Samuel opened the door and admitted us in. There was only one other person there. This is Wilhelm Fortwanger, she said. He will listen to you play. There was an old upright piano, Weichstein, out of tune. Walter sat down and played no more than three minutes of the Weichstein sonata. Dr. Fortwanger suddenly stood. He said, I will try to help and rest quickly. The very next day, we received an official permit to leave. We took the train to Paris. And we were happy. But I began to make a name for himself. Then, June 1940, they took Walter away. I was Jewish. My maiden name was Müller. Yes, yes, I have this list I remember now. These are some of the other people he helped. Jews and non-Jews he helped. <coughs> Ludwig Mitch. Felix Lederer, Josef Christ, Arnold Schönberg, dozens and dozens of people he helped. He helped Walter Sachs, my husband, undoubtedly the finest pianist of his generation. I find out more. I keep asking. I write letters. I give evidence. Because I know what you want to do. You want to destroy him. Isn't that true? You want to burn him. The state. We are only trying to find out the truth. Oh, how can you find out the truth? There is no such thing. Who's true? The victims? The vanquished? The victims? The dead? Who's true? No. You have only one duty. To determine who is good and who is evil. That is all there is to it. To destroy now one good man is to make the future impossible. Don't behave like them, please. I know what I am talking about. The good are few and far between. You must honor the good, especially when there are few, like Dr. Fortwinger and the children of the good, like Fräulein Straum. Gee, I mean, you're really famous in this city. I want to see him, please. I want to know if he remembers Walter. <coughs> I want to know if he remembers that night Walter played the opening of the Waldstein Sonata on an out of tune Bechstein upright piano in the Berlin cellar. Tamara, not today. We have to talk to your benefactor first, you see? You're going to set fire to him. Oh, come you? on, Tamara. I'm only an investigating officer. I don't have the power to set fire to anybody, even if I wanted to, which I don't, believe me. Okay, here's what we'll do. Uh, Amy will take you out the back way, and she's going to get Sergeant Benelli to take you wherever you want to go. This is my number. I want you to call me if you need anything. I mean anything at all. Food, cigarettes, medicine, anything. How's that sound? It sounds as if you're going to burn him. Emmy, take Tamara out of that thing. Would you like this list? I have a copy. You take it, Tamara. And the copy. Christ, are we going to nail him? We are going to nail him 
good and proper. You don't see it, do you? No, I don't see how a list of people who he's supposed to... David, help. last month I was in Vienna. I had with me an Austrian driver, Max, his name was. He spent time in the camps. We were looking at these Viennese, cleaning up the bomb damage, scavenging for rotten food, cigarette butts, anything. I said to think a million of these people turned out on the day Adolf entered the city to welcome him. A million of them. And look at them. And Max said, oh, Major, not these people. These people were all at home hiding Jews in their attics. You get the point, David? The point is they're full of shit. If I may say so, Major, I think Dr. Footbangler's in a different category. He is, after all, one of the most famous conductors of this century. I'm going to tell you another story, David. Before I got this assignment, I was an IT course interrogating prisoners. And they called for me. They said, you ever heard of Wilhelm Furtwängler? No, I said. You heard of Toscanini? Sure, I said. You heard of Stokowski? Yeah, I said. I heard of him. Old guy with white hair. Looks like Harpo Marx's grandpa. <laughs> yeah, that's the one they said. And this guy, Furtwängler, is bigger than both of them. I get it, I said. The guy's a band leader. <laughs> oh, they laughed. Oh, they really laughed. Well, they said, he may be more than that, Steve. In this neck of the woods, he's probably Bob Hope. And Betty Grable rolled into one. Jeez, I said. And I've never heard of the guy. And you know what they said next? They said, Steve, that's why you get the job. Who's they, Major? Who's they what? Who's the they that sent for you? Who's the they that gave you this assignment? There's no the they, David. <laughs> I'm only doing my job. And always remember, we're dealing here with degenerates. That's all you got to remember. I seen things with these eyes, Major. Major. Oh, Steve, come on, please. Don't treat me as if I'm not on your side. Well, I do that, David, because I don't yet know what side you're on. I think that's insulting. Tough. Hank Greenwood gave me the same feeling. He was interested in justice, evidence, facts. I'm interested in nailing the bastard. Did Benelli find your transport? Yes. OK, Annie, this is it. Go get it. Same rules of engagement. I'll explain why he's here. I'll ask two questions, <laughs> and then Oh, boy, have I been looking forward to this. Dr. Wilhelm Furtwängler. Chamber of Music, you used that title, didn't you? But 
then I suppose you had no choice there either, because I suppose uh, Joseph just sent you a telegram saying, Dear Mr. Vice President? No, I don't think Gerber sent me a telegram. I was simply told in a letter, I think. I don't remember exactly. Oh, you don't remember exactly. Okay. But hell, Herman and Joseph are sure heaping honors on you. One uh, makes you a pretty counselor, the other one makes you vice president of the Chamber of Music, and you weren't even a member of the party. How do you explain that? Well, there was a constant battle between Goering and Goebbels as to which of them would control Nazi culture. People like me and Richard Strauss were simply in the middle. We were just pawns. <coughs> anyway, I resigned from the Chamber of Music at the same time as I resigned as musical director of the Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra in 1934. Why was that? Why did you resign, Dr. Kutbanker? They came to power in January 33. In April, I wrote an open letter to the newspapers, <coughs> condemning what they were doing to music, making all these distinctions between Jews and non-Jews. For my part, the only divide in art is between good and bad. Great artists are rare, I said, and no country can do without them unless it wishes to damage its cultural life irrevocably. I also said that men like Otto Klemperer, Bruno Walter, Max Reinhardt, I may have mentioned others, I don't remember now, must be allowed to serve their art here in this country. And then you resigned? No, not then. Those were early days. No, the matter came to a head when Goebbels decided to ban Matisse the painter, an opera by Paul Hindemith. They called it Jew-infected Bolshevik music or some such nonsense. Again, I wrote to the newspapers. Again, I criticized them. Goebbels retaliated with a speech in which he denounced me for what he called my disloyalty to the regime. That's when I resigned. I resigned everything. I simply withdrew from public life and started composing again, which I had always thought was my true vocation. Eventually, after much toing and froing, I was summoned by Goebbels. He said I could leave the country if I wanted to, but under no condition would I ever be allowed to return. That would have been a victory for them. I believe you have to fight inside, not from without. He then demanded, I acknowledge Hitler as solely responsible for cultural policies. Well, that was a fact. He was the sole arbiter, and it seemed to me pointless to deny it. In return, I demanded I be allowed to stay here to work, but I would not be obliged to accept any official position, nor would I have to perform at state functions. I've always held the view that art and politics should have nothing to do with each other. Oh, really? Then why did you conduct one of the Nuremberg rallies? I did not conduct at the rally. I conducted on the evening before the rally. That sounds like a small print. One of our insurance policies will help. I had nothing to do with the rally. And what about April 19th, 1942, uh, the eve of Adolf's 53rd birthday, the big night, the big celebration? You conducted for Adolf, didn't you? Was that in keeping with your view? That art and politics have nothing to do with each other? But that was a different matter. I don't believe that. I was tricked. Oh, how come? I was in Vienna, rehearsing the Ninth Symphony of Beethoven with the Vienna Philharmonic. And Goebbels called and said I had to conduct at Hitler's birthday. Always, I had managed to wriggle out of such invitations by pleading previous engagements, illness, and so on. I was also fortunate that Baldur von Schirach, who controlled Vienna, hated Goebbels and would do anything to thwart his wishes. He had often helped me in the past by saying, for example, that he had the prior claim on my services. But on that particular occasion, in 1942, Goebbels got to my doctors before me, they were frightened off, and von Schirach was threatened and bullied and gave in. I had no alternative but to conduct for Hitler. Believe me, I knew I had compromised and I deeply regret it. Von Schirach, von Schirach. Is that the same Baldur von Schirach, the Nazi youth leader who's now sitting in the dock at Nuremberg, on trial for his life, charged with crimes against humanity? So that's how you were tricked, huh? Doesn't sound much of a trick to me. To the best of my knowledge, that is what happened. The trick was that pressure was brought to bear before I was able to maneuver. The regime knew as well as I did that I had not bowed my knee. It doesn't sound like that to me. It sounds to me like you made a deal. I made no deal. My only concern was preserving the highest musical standards. That I believe to be my mission. I don't buy that. It's the truth. Do you know or remember a pianist called Walter Sachs? No. Young Jewish pianist? No. The pupil of, uh, what was that teacher's name? Mira Samuel. 
I knew Milo Samuel. And you remember this pupil of hers playing to you in a cellar here in Berlin? Vaguely. What was his name? Walter Sachs. Sachs? Sachs? His widow attacked you a minute ago. No one's attacked me. In the waiting room. That woman did not attack me. She was trying to kiss my hand. Oh, right, right. That's because she was so grateful to you. She wanted to thank you for helping her husband. You got him a permit to leave for Paris. How did you do that? I can't remember. There were so many. Yeah, yeah. We've heard about all the folks you helped. I'm interested in how you learned about it. Did you call someone you knew? I may have. As I said, I simply don't remember. Well, let me ask. Let me guess it. You picked up the phone and you made a call. Hi, Adolf. Wilhelm speaking. Listen, old pal, there's a Jew boy pianist I want you to help. Yeah. Gee. That's really nice of you, Wilhelm. Shall I have to pick it up, or uh, will you send it round? God bless you, Adolf, and Heil fucking Hitler. Or maybe you called uh, Herman or Joseph, because you see, Wilhelm, I think you made a deal. I think you shook hands with the devil. You became real close to him and his cohorts. So close, you were in the same shithouse as them. You could write their asses for them. Emmy, for Christ's sake, how can you take notes with your goddamn fingers? You... Emmy! Oh, uh, this is Amy Straw, Wilhelm. She's a very sensitive girl. So, Wilhelm, how many Jews do you think you helped? I have no idea. Oh, that many, huh? I am not going to defend myself by trumpeting numbers. <laughs> May I ask a question? Sure. When will my case be heard by the tribunal? Your guess is as good as mine. I recently visited your colleagues in Wiesbaden, the American occupation authorities, those charged with assisting my defense. They were extremely polite and helpful. They said this they wouldn't. This isn't Wiesbaden. I'm not here to defend you. I need to work. I need to make my living. I have been living off the generosity of friends. Yes, but these things take time. Then why is it, please, that another conductor, who was actually a member of the party, I believe he joined twice, why has he already been cleared and is working again while I have to wait and wait and I wait? I don't know who he is. It wasn't my case. And why is it, please, that on good authority I have learned that certain high-ranking Nazi scientists are, even as we speak, being transported to the United States to work on missiles and rocket fuels? That's what we call the spoils of war, Wilhelm. Different professions, different rules. Why did you escape to Switzerland in January of last year? What? Why did you escape to Switzerland last year? Because I learned that the Gestapo were about to arrest me. Why were they going to arrest you? I am not absolutely sure, but I believe it was because of another letter I had written to Goebbels lamenting the decline of musical standards due to racial policies. But you didn't complain about the racial policies, just about the decline in musical standards? Is that right? So. How did you learn that the Gestapo were out to get you? During an enforced hour-long interval, because of a power failure at a concert in the Blüthner Hall here in Berlin, Albert Speer, the Minister of Armaments, said to me casually, you look very tired, Maestro, you should go abroad for a while. I understood exactly what he meant. Is that the same Albert Speer, who's now sitting next to your other friend, Baldur? in the dock at Nuremberg, also charged with crimes against humanity. <laughs> you sure knew a lot of people in high places, Wilhelm? Well, it would be truer to say that a lot of people in high places knew me. Don't get smart with me! <coughs> because your friends seem to be just a bunch of criminal shitheads. But I know, and you know, that you were real close to all of them. To Adolf, and Herman, and Joseph and Baldur, and now Albert. Make the call, the Jew is safe. Right and ask there, Albert says leave town. So let's hear the truth, will now? Let's come clean. What was your party number? If you are going to bully me like this, Major, you had better do your homework. You obviously have no idea how stupid and impertinent your remarks are. Sir. You remember, David, I said I had a question for Wilhelm that he wouldn't be able to answer. Well, I'm going to ask it now. You ready for this, Wilhelm? Take your time. It's a tough one. Why didn't you leave right at the start, in 1933, when Adolf came to power? I have some names here, people in your line of business. Well, Bruno Walter, Otto Klemperer. They are Jews. They had to leave. They were right to leave. I love my country and my people. That is a matter of body and soul. 
I could not leave my country in her deepest misery. To have left in 1933 or 34 would have been shameful. I remained because I wanted to give comfort. I wanted to see that the glorious musical tradition of which I believe I am one of the guardians remained unbroken, was intact when we walked from the nightmare. I remained because I believed my place was with my people. You see, David, he can't answer the question. I'll ask it again, well, now this time don't give me any more airy, fairy bullshit. I have given you my reasons, Major, and I only hope you'll be as hard on other artists who have remained in their countries. Shostakovich, Prokofiev, Eisenstein, especially Eisenstein, with his films glorifying tyranny. But you could accuse them all of glorifying tyranny. I don't know who they are, not on my list. No, they're Russians. The Russians? Yeah, the Russians. Major Arnold Dombey. It's Major Richards for Lieutenant Vins. Will? Yes? Yeah, you want me to tell him? Major Richards wants a word. Yeah. I've had enough of this, I'm leaving now. I don't think that would be advisable. Oh, you're kidding. Dr. Goodfanger. <laughs> when I was 10 in 1932, my father, he was a publisher, allowed me to accompany him on a business trip to Berlin. On the second evening of our visit, he took me to the Philharmonic. I don't remember the whole program, but you conducted both Beethoven's Egmont Overture and the Fifth Symphony. I think the program ended with the Overture to Tannhäuser. You opened a new world to me. Unbelievable. More than a world. Like waking from sleep, a child of ten, waking to a new world. You showed me a place where there was an absence of misery. Ever since I first heard you, music has been central to my life. My chief comfort. And I've needed comfort. I thank you. Ah, 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 ah. I too, the same. Oh. Thank you. Yeah, well, I'm. Um, yeah, sure, I'll take it. Madame, Sie mich zum ersten Mal als Dirigente begrüßen. Hier in Berlin, 1943. Well, I gotta hand it to the British. You know what those guys are? Decent. Well, now, tell me, do you know Hans Hinkel? Do I know Hans Hinkel? Why does everybody repeat? My questions. Do I know Hans Hinkel? You see, there he goes again. Yes, I know him. A despicable human being. Ask Bruno Walter. You know what his job was in the Ministry of Culture? Hinkel's job? To get rid of Jews in the arts. And since the most talented artists were inevitably Jewish, he was seldom idle. I could detail his persecution of my former secretary, Bertha Geismar, herself a Jewish. But I will not bore you with the chronicle of cruelty, meanness, and mendacity. Yep, sounds like the same guy, all right. You know what else this little creep did? He kept files, close on 250,000 files. And you know what's in those files? How should I know? Oh, boy, you're going to love this. Those files contain, wait for this, the details on every artist working in this country for guess who? That's right, your old pals Adolf and Herman and Joseph. Those files are going to tell us when all of you joined the party, who was helpful, and who informed. What's more, they're full of love letters to your aforementioned pal, swearing everlasting loyalty. Isn't that something? A file on every one of you. Some guy, that Hinkle. I should like to leave now. Yeah, I bet you would. So why don't you? See, we got uh, work to do sifting through those files, and that'll take some time, I guess, so get out of here. And we'll call you back when we're good and ready. We got him. See, uh, the moment I mentioned Hinkle, he wanted out of here. Boy, oh boy. Emmy, give David a list of the witnesses and uh, then get us a cup of coffee, will you? David, here's what I want you to do. These are pretty well verbatim of my interrogations. We'll compare the answers to shit that David put in the info and Hinkle's archive. This is an Aladdin's cave. Jeez, when you think the Russians had a whole archive in their hands until the city was divided and they didn't know what it was. You know what they'll be doing now? Shitting razor blades.
one hand on your dick. <laughs> Guess. You like guessing games. Love them. I give up. What you got in your hand? Helmet? No, Fräulein Straube. No, that's because I want to see you alone, Helmet. Off the record. So what you got there? Oh, you can't guess. Helmet? I think I know what it is. What? A pair of goggles and a telescope for spying on people, right? No, <coughs> Mitch, not at all. A white stick by Jiminy, good boy. <laughs> no, Major, not a white stick. A baton, a conductor's baton. Not just a baton, but the baton. My guilty secret, the maestro's baton, which I stole. The one he kept in his right hand so he didn't have to salute and make cocaine all size out. You remember? Oh, how could I forget? Well, would you look at this? I'm holding the baton. That he kept in his right hand so he didn't have to salute and poke Adolf Sider. Show me, helmet. Show me. Yeah, show me. I want to see you do it. Come on, take the baton. Now, pretend I'm Adolf and uh, you're the maestro. Come on. <laughs> you got the baton in your right hand, but you, uh, give me the salute just the same. No, really, Mitch, I don't like giving oh, the salute. Do it, helmet. <laughs> do it right, helmet. Oh. Great doing that. <laughs> I see what you mean. You almost broke my eye out. <laughs> exactly. Uh, perhaps you'll do me a favor, Major. If you're seeing the maestro again, perhaps you would be so good as to return the baton to him. It is, after all, his property, but please don't tell me you took it. Oh, don't worry, Helmet. It'll be our secret. Oh. In the meantime, you can practice conducting. <laughs> I saw you had some of our records. Oh, I am on this one. The ninth. Second fiddle. <laughs> Difficult to identify me exactly, but you're working late tonight, Major. You don't usually see people this late. All in the cause of humanity, Alan. Or uh, should I call you 1049331? 1049331? Or, or do you mind if I just call you one? You know what I say you are, Alan? I say you're a piece of shit. Bastard. The bust! Uh, who's the bust? Helmet, uh, Hinkle? Oh, why? Why, particularly? He said there'd be no record. No fight. Oh, he promised to remove your file. And you thought we'd never find out. You thought we'd never find out you were the party's man in the orchestra, Hinkle's man. <laughs> oh, don't take on so, Helmet. You've only got one party number. A guy called Herbert Von Karajan's got two. Uh, by the way, uh, why do you suppose he joined the party twice? Once in Austria, once here. Guess he just wanted them to know he cared, huh? So, party member 1049331, talk to me. Don't <coughs> confess my sins. Yeah, I've been keeping absolute. Don't you guys have to do penance? What's your penance, huh? I'm living up to the rest of my Hold it. Your story moves me deeply. Let me wipe away the tears. I'm so choked up I can't speak. You don't know what it's like to wake up to a power so terrifying, so immense that all you can think <laughs> that you have to become part of it. Otherwise, you'll be eaten alive. And here's something else you won't understand. Absolute power offers absolute certainty and absolute hope. Doesn't matter if I understand or not. Helmet, just get off your chest. You would never have the slightest inkling of how corrupt the power was. Yes, corrupt and corrupting. You have never experienced a kind of terror, so there is no way I can make it clear to you. You start by censoring what you say, and then you censor what you think, <coughs> and in the end you censor what you feel. That is the greatest degradation because it means the entire individual will is paralyzed, and all that remains is an obedient husk. In my case, yeah, I'm gonna go on. In your case, began with the realization. And what was that? Huh? I'm not the best violinist in the world. You're not. I don't think, I would never in my wildest dreams have been even second violinist in the Berlin Philharmonic. But when they got rid of the Jews in the orchestra, there were vacancies for people like me. This I believe to be just. I can trace my ancestry back to the 13th century. I'm told a lot of Jews can go back even further than that. <laughs> I lied about something. You surprised me, Albert. No, I have to set the record straight. I told you it was my idea that the maestro should come on with the baton in his right hand. Uh -huh. Well, it wasn't my idea at all. 
<laughs> the idea came from Franz Yastrow. It was the hocus to his handy man. Oh, gee, that sure changes the whole picture, huh? <laughs> well, I don't think the Meister even knows of my existence. Sad violin. A conductor is also a dictator, you know. He's also a terrifying power who gives hope and, and certainty and guarantees order. I wanted to be in the Meister's power, too. Uh, the orchestra is a symbol, you see. No more philosophy, please, Hamlet. Because I want to talk to you about something practical. You ever heard of plea bargaining? <coughs> talk about power. I have the power to let you go find work. Oh, at least in America, it's only. I could give you a job tomorrow, here, in this building. But I'd have to get something in return. You see, Wilhelm, or Helmut, rather, that's called plea bargaining. Now, I have to admit, I thought I'd find a great big fat file in my store. I thought, never mind, two party numbers, he's got three. But his file was just full of letters to uh, Joseph asking him to help this Jew or that Jew. Oh, yes. They used to say there's hardly a Jew left in Germany who would find their head not out. Come on, Albert. I can hand you a letter giving you freedom of movement, freedom to work, freedom, Albert. But I need something in return. How's that for penance? He, he is an anti-Semite, of course. Of course. <laughs> I need facts, Helmut. Hard facts. You have to tell me where to look. <coughs> Major, we're discussing a man of genius here. He's one of the greatest conductors alive, maybe the greatest. Fuck that, Helmut. <coughs> you want to talk symbols here? This guy was a front man. He was the finder, but he played there, too. And you get my philosophical meaning? I'm not interested in the little guy. I'm just interested in... Moby Dick. <laughs> Come on, Helmet. At least tell me what to look for and where to look for it. Hard facts. Uh, you heard of Vittorio de Sabata? No. Uh, uh, Italian. You're kidding. A conductor, a front rank. Front rank just said something like, uh, <coughs> it's impudent for that true Sabata to conduct bombs. Doesn't knock me out, that, Helmet. <laughs> There's a letter. Oh, now I'm hearing music. I like letters. Uh, it must be in the file somewhere. <laughs> uh, to uh, Culture Minister Bernhard Roost. Full of, uh, full of the sort of thing you're looking for. About uh, Arnold Schoenbach, the Jew. You know what I mean. Composer, uh, uh, modern, atonal. What's the date of letter? I have to think. Uh, early, I guess. Before the war. Oh, but, but there's something else I just remembered. Fred Fanger sent Hitler a birthday telegram. He did? Yes. Oddly enough, I had this from one of your people. From one of my people? Yes. Corporal, U.S. Army. Jew. He said he had seen the telegram. It's a chancellor. Son of a gun. We'll find the corporal and we'll find the letter. I, I don't remember his name, but I, I think he'll come back to you. I want you to write all this down, Helmet. <coughs> and I want you to think about this. I just know a deal was made early on. They said, well, now, you don't have to join the party, but just do as we tell you, and you won't have to worry about a goddamn thing. And that's why we never left the country. But I need documentary proof. Do you know anything like that? No. And if I may say so, Major, I, I think you're barking up the wrong tree. Oh, and what's the right tree, Helmut? There's a pattern to be in his behavior, you see. Gebel's understood, and Hinkle. <coughs> I can tell you things. There is a rumor, uh, whether it's true or not, I don't know, but ask him about Fontenelle. Never heard of him. Who is he? Edwin Fontenelle, a music critic. He's the one that gave Pertwein the terrible reviews for the, well, he raved about Helmut von Karajan, the two-time member of the Nazi party. Mm -hmm. Called him the miracle carrier. Fertwängler was outraged, and they say he had von Renault conscripted into the army. Ah. And the same thing happened to another critic, Walter Steinhauer. He savaged Fertwängler for not for not playing more contemporary music. Walter Steinhauer. After that review appeared, he too was conscripted. <laughs> to a lot is not such a bad idea. Critics give you bad reviews. You have them sent to the Russian front. <laughs> <laughs> But if you really want to get Bert Wrangler, ask him about Helmut von Karajan. Is it Miracle Kid? Yes. That I believe will prove fruitful. Ask him about von Karajan, and you may notice he cannot even bring himself to utter the name. Bert uh, refers to him as K. Hmm. And ask him about his private life. His private life?
maybe I'm mellowing. Or maybe this heat's getting to me. Which you know, we shivered through a god awful winter, and now the sun's shining, the central heat's burning. The military, God bless him. No sign of the band leader. I wish you'd call him Dr. Paul Sanger. No, he isn't here. But then it's not yet nine o'clock. Why, well, you know this, Major. I wish you'd call me Steve, Henry. No, I'm not nervous. I'm just not getting enough sleep. Bad dreams, and that's when I'm awake. Uh, now, Emmy, if uh, if you want to be out of the room while I talk to him, that's okay by me. What I have to say to him might upset you, and I guess working for me, you get upset enough. What are you going to say to me, Major? Emmy, go for a walk. It's a lovely day out there. Uh, walk in the tear garden. Sit under what's left of the linden trees. David can take notes. You upset me when you avoid asking my questions. But see who that is, Emmy, and if it's a band leader, don't let him in yet. <coughs> Attention, security! <laughs> Watch out, Emmy, you may want to risk you. A woman left this for you, Major. What woman? I don't know her name, but she gave this to Sergeant Adams, and he gave it to me and said it was for you. Oh, did you see her? Yes, of course. I was standing here. Sergeant Adams was here. The woman was not. What does she look like? Old, young, fat, thin, short, tall? No. <laughs> okay, very funny. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, Major. Sergeant Adams said it was for you. Jesus Christ, Helmet, you're supposed to be the security in this building. But I was not told to open packages addressed to military personnel. Security. I mean, for Christ's sake, use your goddamn common sense. Sergeant Adams told me I must search people. He did not say I must search packages. Jesus Christ, Helen, no wonder you were the second violinist. I mean, it stands to reason. A woman leaves me a package. You gotta be curious as to what's in it. Why should I be curious, Major? It's addressed to you. Because it could be a fucking bomb, Helmet. A bomb? <laughs> you think so? Yes, I think so. <laughs> That's an order, Helmet. Open it. But if it's a bomb, Major, shouldn't you take cover or something? Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> Sergeant Adams, Sergeant Adams. Well, feel around inside now. Go on, feel around. <coughs> from the friend. 
French authorities to reside in Paris. And because no one knows when Dr. Fultwangler's case will come before the tribunal, I have requested permission to go abroad. Well, gee, thanks, Tamara. Son of a gun. It's too bad they're all totally irrelevant. There is one here from Dr. Fultwangler. Dear Mrs. Sachs, yes, I remember your husband well. I remember he played on a Bestein, the Wallstein Sonata. He's one of the most beautiful pianists in the world. Get him up off the floor, Amy. You're saying the uh, good guys at Wiesbaden had some questions for me? They, they don't think there's a case against Dr. Furtwängler. They want to know why you're pursuing it. Tell them they'll know after they've heard the evidence. Take a look at that. You'll see what I mean. Mm -hmm. Next question. They think you're being ordered to pursue Dr. Furtwängler. They want to know who's giving the orders and why. Oh, I get it. You've been talking to them, haven't you, David? <coughs> you told them about the they that saw me like headquarters. I remember you were so interested in who the they were. Yes, you see, I was... Well, you tell the good guys at these by the mind their own goddamn business. Are you being ordered, Mason? What's this about a transcript from Nuremberg? Why, Mason? <coughs> why Dr. Fudvang? Why him? Tell me about Nuremberg. Yes. A man named Delaris, Berger Delaris. Berger? His name's Berger? What is it, some kind of short order? A Swede, a manufacturer of goggles, military eyewear. He was called to testify during the defense. <coughs> it is now nine o'clock precisely. I have prepared a statement. I do not intend to be kept waiting again. <coughs> well, now, don't talk to me like I was a second violinist. Go back into the waiting room, sit down, and wait. The straw will come and get you when I am ready to see you. If you're not there when she comes to get you, I'll have you pulled in by the military police. Okay, Wilhelm? Yeah, what have you heard? 
That he's a Moscow hack, a communist. That's the one. Not a nice man. We are not on first name terms. So today, thank your lucky stars, you've only got me to deal with. Now. Let's take it nice and easy, okay? I don't want to go over the old stuff, because I got one or two new things. I wish on. to say something. Oh, go ahead. Be my guest. When I last saw you, I was <coughs> unprepared. I did not know what to expect. In the past weeks, I've been thinking more carefully and making some notes. You have to <laughs> understand who I am and what I am. I am a musician, and I believe in music. I am an artist, and I believe in art. You could say that art is my religion. Art in general, and music of course in particular, has for me mystical powers which nurture men's spiritual needs. I must confess, however, to having been extremely naive. I insisted for many years, until quite recently in fact, on the absolute separation of art and politics. I truly had no interest in politics. I hardly read the newspapers. My entire life was devoted to music because, and this is very important, I believed that I could, through music, preserve something practical. And what was that? Liberty, humanity, and oh, justice. Gee, Wilhelm, that's a thing of beauty. Honest to God, a thing of beauty. I'm going to try to remember that. How's it go again? Liberty, humanity, and justice. Oh, beautiful. But to... Uh, you use the word naive. Are you now saying you think you were wrong, that uh, art and politics can't be separated? I believe they should be kept separate, but that they were not kept separate, I learned to my cause. And when did you first learn that? When you sent the telegram, was that uh, the surrender signal, the uh, waving of the white flag? What telegram? Happy birthday, dear Adolf, love Wilhelm. More words to that effect. That sounds to me like you were dropping on your knees and saying, okay, Adolf, you win. You're top dog and everything, so let's be pals. Have a swell party. Was that uh, when you first decided that art and politics couldn't be separated when you sent telegrams? I have no idea what you're talking about. I'm talking about the birthday greetings to your old pal Adolf. I never sent him birthday greetings, nor any other kind of greetings. Think carefully, Wilhelm. I don't have to think carefully. This is utterly ridiculous. I never sent him a telegram. Yes, David. Why not show Dr. Furtwängler the evidence? Perhaps it would refresh his memory. I can't find this telegram in the files. Emmy, do you have a copy of it? No, I have never seen such a telegram. Major, if you'll tell me where You it is. won't find it because no such telegram exists. Well, I tried. You have to admit, I tried. I thought I might just trap you there, well, how? but uh, David here was too quick for me. Smart move, David, smart move. No, I don't have the telegram, but I know it exists. And I just want to say, Wilhelm, we're going to keep looking for it, because I happen to believe that you said it. Then you are wrong. Art and politics. Yeah, art and politics. Are you saying that uh, touring abroad, conducting the Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra in foreign lands from 1933 on wasn't a commercial for Adolf and all that he stood for? We never, never officially represented the regime when we played abroad. We always played as a private ensemble. Uh -huh. As I think I already told you, after 34, I was a freelance. You know something, Wilhelm? You should have written our policies for us, because you've got more exclusion clauses than double indemnity. Don't give me fine print again. I'm an expert when it comes to fine print. What do you imagine people thought? The Berlin Philharmonics taken over by Joseph's propaganda ministry, but Wilhelm's a freelance, so music and politics are now entirely separate? Is that what you believe ordinary people thought? I have no idea what ordinary people thought, no. because I had only one intention from 1933 onwards. Whatever I did, this is also the real reason I did not leave my country. I had only one intention, and that was to prove that art means more than politics. Does that include Herbert von Karajan? What? I don't know what you mean. Tell me about von der Neu. Von der Neu? Yeah, von der Neu. Von der Neu. How long is this going to go on, Wilhelm? I say von der Neu, you say von der Neu. I say von der Neu, you say von der Neu. <laughs> you go on like this all day. You know who von der Neu is, don't you? Edwin von der Neu, music critic? Yes, I know who he is. Isn't it true? 
that because he gave you bad reviews and praised this young guy, Von Karajan, mm -hmm. called him a goddamn miracle, said he was better than you. You had Bonnerville conscripted into the army and nobody's heard from him since. That is an outrageous lie! Are you sure you didn't call one of your close buddies and say, God in heaven, did you see what that guy Bonnerville wrote about me? I want him out of the way. Same with that other critic, Steinhauer. He had the nerve to accuse me, the greatest conductor on earth, of not playing enough modern music. Send him to Stalingrad. Isn't that what you did? You don't like criticism, do you? You certainly didn't like them saying there was another conductor better than you. Please stop playing these games with me. You seem to take pleasure in teasing and baiting and hectoring me. Uh, some way God for my intelligence. We are dealing here with matters concerning my entire existence, my career, my life. Why don't you use the name of, of, of another conductor is beyond my understanding? I'll tell you why. Remember we talked about you playing for Adolf's birthday and you told me Joseph got to your doctor's first that you were tricked out? Yes, and that is what happened. Well, I have a different story to tell. I don't believe you were tricked. Not the way you describe. I believe something else happened. <clears throat> I've looked at the Hinkle archive, made a few inquiries. I've seen records of phone calls. And putting it all together, this is what I think. I think Joseph said, Wilhelm, if you won't conduct for Adolf's birthday, we'll get the miracle kid. The guy that critic Bonnerville thinks is the greatest conductor in the world, the guy you call Kay. He's not just willing to conduct for Adolf's birthday, he's offered to sing happy birthday as a solo. Come on, Wilhelm. He's 34 years old. You're already 56. He's the young pretender, the comet. Yeah, the miracle. He's tilting at your throne. Your position's in danger. And Herman and Joseph keep saying to you, if you don't do it, well, I'm okay, well. Never mind art and politics and symbols and airy, fairy bullshit about liberty, humanity, and justice. You were tricked, all right, because they got you where you were most vulnerable. You was knocking on the door. And I don't care how great you are, how noble, how fantastic with your little white stick, because it's the oldest story in the book. The aging Romeo, jealous of the young buck. The heavyweight champion of the world, frightened of the young contender. And the great maestro, terrified of the new boy in the podium. Wasn't that how they got you, Wilhelm? Time after time? Admit it. The real reason you didn't leave the country when you knew you should have was that you were. You were frightened. Once you were out of the way, you'd be supplanted by the miracle. The party's boy, twice with the flashy, talented little cake. This is absolute, absolute nonsense. Danger. Wait a moment. Where is this leading? Not this now, is... David. I haven't finished with it. As a matter of fact, I've hardly begun. I'm only just developing my theme. So isn't that what you call it in classical music, is developing a theme? OK, well, now, so they played on your insecurity. Yes, human, understand, but I can be ashamed of. After all, it's uh, Pretty well agreed that little K's got what it takes. Nearly everybody at the party loved him. Jesus, he's a member twice over. He's one of theirs. But take note of what I said. I said nearly everyone at the party. Because there's one exception. One guy doesn't like little K as much as he likes you. There's one guy who thinks little K is not fit to brush your coattails. And that guy just happens to be, that's right, the number one man. Your old pal, Adolf. He thinks you're the greatest. When he says, I want Wilhelm for my birthday party, boy, they better go get Wilhelm. So Joseph calls and threatens you with little K. And you said, to hell with the ninth in Vienna. I'll give it to Adolf as a birthday present in Berlin. Wasn't that how they got you? That's how you were tricked. They got you by the balls and they squeezed. Hard. Major, I simply can't see how this line of reasoning... What is this? What are you all of a sudden? Counselor for the defense? What do you want me to say? Objection overruled? Objection sustained? My line of questioning is establishing motive, Counselor. Plain, ordinary human motive. Why did he stay? Why did he play for them? Why was he the flight carrier for the regime? Why was he their servant? Not art or culture and music and its mystical powers but good old-fashioned fear, insecurity, and jealousy. 
And that was only part of it. Really of course, crazy. there was a conspiracy against me, a campaign that controlled the press. Every word that was written, every word that was published. When I resigned from the Philharmonic, when I refused to take part in a film they made about the orchestra, yes, countless things of that kind, refusing to cooperate in one way or another, they were determined to keep me in my place. You mentioned the critic, Edwin von der Nöhl, his praise of Bob Bob. That man may have been general, I have no idea. But his remarks were encouraged and guided and then seized on. They wanted another star, as they called it, to take my place. They had their own concert agency under a man named Rudolf Feather, a human being beneath contempt. He was determined to foist K on the public. I'm going to recount the difficulties I had with that man. Let me just tell you that his chief ally in this was Rudolf von Albensleben, personal adjutant to Heinrich Himmler. And when that particular individual did not get his way, he threatened only one sanction, death. They controlled every aspect of our lives. They manipulated and bullied and imposed their monstrous will. And they finally understood that I would do everything in my power to prevent art from being directed and supervised. They determined to undermine me. They regarded any action of dissent, however small, as a criticism of the state, had amount to high treason. And you didn't have Fondernot conscripted into the army because of that <laughs> review he wrote? I told you it is absolute nonsense. How could I have managed such a thing? He was in their power, not mine. It is a total lie. I have never, never in my life tried or even wanted to silence my critics. Never! I believe serious criticism to be an essential part of cultural life. And the reason you have detected a certain distaste I have for uh, K is not because I am jealous or insecure, but because I have serious criticism to make of him. In my opinion, he's an intellectual conductor. He does not experience the peace afresh each time. He only conducts what he knows and what he wants, in other words, the nuances, which is why the nuances are all exaggerated. <laughs> slow tempi are too slow. The fast one's too fast. The whole effect is somewhat hysterical. <laughs> you know, Wilma, I'm trying to understand you. I really am. You see, when you talk about cultural life, I'm totally lost. Because I am, to put it at its best, totally uncultured. So when I look at you, I don't see the great artist, the greatest conductor alive. I see a man, an ordinary guy, like a million other ordinary guys. And I ask myself, what keeps him in a position which he says he did everything in his power to resist Except, get the hell out of it. What keeps him here, I ask myself. Now, not being a cultured guy, I don't buy all this stuff about music preserving liberty, humanity, and justice. I look for ordinary reasons, reasons I can understand, reasons my buddies can understand. So if I said to my buddies, imagine you love your wife. No, 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 no. Maybe I'm stretching reality here to stay with me. Okay. I say to them, Imagine you love your wife, and they tell you you're being sent overseas, but they exempt some young guy who it's possible might take your wife's fancies. What are you going to do? Like a man, they'd say, Steve, we do everything in our power to stay put. See, well, I'm, I'm talking about ordinary, everyday motives, which is why I like to discuss your private life. Come along, Major. This can't be right. Objection overruled. Establishing motive. How many illegitimate children do you have? Major, this is outrageous. What has this to do with anything at You'll all? You'll see. Wilhelm, did you hear the question? I have illegitimate children. What? I said I have illegitimate children. I don't know how many. No, I bet you don't. <laughs> Four? Five? Six? You like the ladies, don't you, Wilhelm? <laughs> Isn't it true that before every concert, you got a woman in your dressing room and you gave her the old conductor's guitar, isn't that true? Major, yeah. this is deeply offensive and repugnant. Too bad. And totally outrageous. Not so, Counselor. The women threw themselves at you, didn't they, Wilhelm? That secretary of yours, Berta Geismar, 
who's now working for Sir Thomas Beecham. She wasn't just your secretary, was she? She was your procuress. She procured women for you, as many and as often as you wanted. Stop this, please. No, I'm not going to stop it, because if I said to my buddies, you're living in a whorehouse where you get the horse free, you're going to leave? <laughs> See, well, Tom, I think you'd stay because you were in paradise here. Adolf himself offered you a beautiful house and a, and a special bomb shelter. I absolutely refused the house and the bomb shelter. But you see what I'm getting at, don't you? You didn't leave because you felt an affinity with your people, because you believed you were upholding the traditions of which I think you said you were a guardian, or because you felt that music and art and culture were about politics. See, if I said to my buddies, you're a top dog in your profession, favorite of the number one man in the country. You get all the women you lust after. You're highly paid. You get a beautiful house and a personal private bomb shelter if you want it. You're going to leave or stay? One voice comes back at me, stay. Major, that is not a good argument. If Dr. Furtwang, who did indeed enjoy these, these privileges, he enjoyed them because of who he is and what he is. So now we're back to the great art. Right. His position would have guaranteed him anything he wanted wherever he chose to live and work. That's true of any leading artist in any country of the world. They're rare specimens, Major, and that sets them apart. Okay, but it doesn't make them saints. They still have to get up and piss in the middle of the night. <laughs> and they, they can still be vindictive and envious and mean, just like you and me. Well, just like me. Can't they? See, well, everybody says you are such a benefactor to the Jews. But what about that uh, Italian conductor? I don't understand what you're talking about. But if you are now referring to Arturo Toscanini, he's not a Jew, of course, but he's greatly loved by you Americans. No, I'm thinking of a different Italian. To my taste, he is too disciplined. His temper are too strict. If he were a greater artist, if he had deeper insights, a livelier imagination, greater warmth and devotion to the work, he would not have become so disciplined. This is why his success is disastrous. Inspiration and understanding in art are more important than discipline and autocratic behavior. But otherwise, you like the guy. <laughs> I'm beginning to get a picture, Wilhelm. You're not crazy about any of your rivals, are you? I guess it was the same with that other Italian I was thinking of, uh, De Sabata. De Sabata. Vittorio De Sabata. I have a letter here written in 1939, which states, what should I do when Dr. Verfangler said to me that it was a piece of impudence for that Jew, de Savada, to conduct Brahms? Since the day when de Savada performed Tristan in Bayreuth, Furtwängler speaks only of Jew Savada. Who wrote that letter? I'm not at liberty to tell you that, but it's a genuine letter. David, you got a copy in your file. It's a genuine letter. There is only one thing I can say. I never said anything that goes counter to my convictions, and simply cannot have said anything that day. Of course, there were instances when I was speaking to specific party members. I had to use their language. You had to say, Heil Hitler, for example. But quite apart from these instances, I did not make any compromises by saying things other than I believed. And I've always been quite frank in my attitude towards the Jews. Yeah, I believe that. But just answer the question. Don't give me explanations. But I have to explain. An attitude has to exist in one to make such an outburst possible. And this is what I deny. I know that even in the greatest anger, I could not have said such a thing. De Sabata was my friend, one of my few close friends. I invited him to conduct my orchestra. We discussed his program. We discussed everything. Okay, what about this letter? July 4th, 1933, written by you to the Minister of Culture, Bernhard Roost. It's about this modern composer, Jew, Arnold Schoenberg, who's about to be suspended. There's a copy of this in your file, too, David. This is what you wrote, Wilhelm. Arnold Schoenberg is considered by the Jewish International as the most significant musician of the present. It must be recommended that he be not made a martyr. Why do you say that? I say exactly what I said before. You have to use their language. And you didn't finish the letter, Major. And if he is suspended now, and I would not indeed consider this right, the question of indemnity should be treated with generosity. He's pleading for the man, Major, not condemning Okay, what about these things he said? Jewish pen pushers should be removed from the press. Jewish musicians lack a genuine affinity with our music, and Jewish musicians are good businessmen with few scruples, lacking roots. You deny you said those things? But it depends to whom one was speaking. It depends on the circumstances. These attitudes simply don't exist in me. 
I used their language. Of course I did. Everyone did. You have to balance these things, if indeed he said them, against his assistance to his Jewish colleagues. Listen to this, Major. Transcript from the proceedings at Nuremberg. Okay, Counselor, it's your turn, your day in court, but be careful. There's nothing I enjoy more than a guy putting his own neck in a noose. This Swedish businessman, Berger Del Ares, testified in cross-examination that he'd had several bit meetings with Hermann Göring. I first saw Göring, Del Ares testified, embroiled in a stormy interview with Wilhelm Furtwängler, the famous conductor of the Berlin Philharmonic, who was vainly seeking permission to keep his Jewish concert master. Yes, I remember well. I was pleading for Simon Goldberg, a wonderful musician and a wonderful man, the youngest concert master the orchestra ever had. Thank God he escaped, and I pray he is safe now. Why is it, Wilhelm, that everything you say touches me so deeply? Emmy, read one of those letters from Mrs. Zox. Pick any one. Read it. Untouched, 
untainted. If I had taken any active part in politics, I could not have remained here. Please understand me correctly. An artist cannot be entirely apolitical. He must have some political convictions because he is, after all, a human being. As a citizen, it is an artist's duty to express these convictions. But as a musician, I am more than a citizen. I am a citizen of this country in that eternal sense to which the genius of great music testifies. I know that a single performance of a great masterpiece was a stronger and more vital negation of the spirit of Buchenwald and Auschwitz than words. Human beings are free wherever Wagner and Beethoven are played. The music transported them to regions where the torturers and murderers could do them no harm. Yes, it would have been better. 
certain I would have acted courageously. What about you, Major? I have a feeling we might just have followed orders. I'm only a claims assessor. Who mm -hmm. cares about me? But everybody kept saying your man was something special. You know what? He's not special at all. You know what I say he is, Major? <coughs> no, what do you say he is, David? I say he's like a fallen priest. I'm Alex Vogel. And what would you know about priests, Lieutenant Vile? Only what I read in books. Yeah, and what you read? That they can be inadequate human beings. That they can lie, they can fornicate, they can deceive, they can drink, but they can still put God into the mouths of faithful. If you believe in that sort of thing. What oh, I say you are, David? I know what you say I am, Major. Yeah, but you're worse. You're a liberal. Oh, shit. You're on the right from wrong. Delbert Clark, New York Times. Jesus Christ! What the hell are you doing? Turn that goddamn thing. 